Okay, welcome everybody to creating an open source fraud risk management system in order to close the financial inclusion gap. Um, I'm Greg McCormick, I'll be the presenter today. I'm a member of the Mojo Loop Foundation Technical Governing Board, and I'm also, I work for Cyber and Systems as a day job as a Chief Strategic, strategic Business Development Officer. I work for Cyber and Systems as a day job as a Chief Strategic Business Development Officer. Uh, what I want to talk to you today is about um, how to solve financial inclusion, how to, to uh, take action. What I want to talk to you today is about a journey that started years ago with a project called Mojulu. So that's why we see Mojulu Foundation all over this stuff. Um, the idea was to build a central switch, and that central switch would um, lower the cost of operations for, for um, therefore ease financial inclusion in doing so. And it's very expensive to run a national switch. It's um, also a lot of the techniques behind it are old, real time, um, didn't exist, things like that. So uh, we thought about to uh, solve that problem. And during that problem, we also realized that we needed to solve the problem of fraud. So very early on, this was decided that there would be a fraud part of this project that really wouldn't be part of this project. So if Mojaloop has uh, created its own foundation at this point in time and it's off on its own, uh, seeking its own funding and things like that. But, um, but, but, but how do we, how did we go about that? We'll get to that in just a second. So, so first off, you know, what are all the different ways that we would improve financial inclusion? Uh, simplify access and improve the rules for accessing financial inclusion. Um, right now, uh, it's known that some of the FATC rules, the KYC process that you hear about, were probably a little too stringent um, for um, uh, people that don't have documentation. If you don't have documentation, you don't have an ID, therefore you don't have an identity. There's all, I could go on and on about this. They've been working on this problem for years uh, with risk-based assessment models. Um, increasing the access by creating more and better programs. So this is through uh, veterans from the Gates Foundation and, and others um, that are, are seeking to add systems for financial inclusion throughout the world. Uh, reduce the friction of onboarding. So how do we make it easier for somebody to actually join a system, which is everything from identity to also the process, just make it simpler, quicker, and easier. Um, and then how do we reduce the friction of using Mojaloop, the ease of use, is the, one of the areas that we're trying to do with that, and then the interoperability. So how do we make that switch work with other switches much more easily? Uh, so this is some of the problems that we've been trying to solve. And more importantly, how do we reduce the cost, right? And we reduce the cost with open source software. Um, so open source can't solve every problem. Sorry, it, it can't. Uh, there are times where, uh, where some good old uh, commercial off-the-shelf uh, resolutions need to be done. Um, but the open source cost, uh, costing structure certainly can drive the cost down of the overall solution and therefore something we wanted to, uh, to look at. So, and we wanted to remove the fraud costs from the system. So how do we look at that? And we're really only just doing that. Mojolib itself has been going on off and on. I'm just going to say five years. I think it's been longer than I think it's eight. Um, but um, how do we reduce the cost of fraud in the system? And, and we do that by obviously making an open source anti-fraud anti software, which we're going to talk about, but also by making a better mousetrap, by making a better system and a better system that is, is easier to be included in other people's solutions so that it can grab some, get some legs behind it. So um, we got given the keys, if you will, and we got told to start from scratch and design from scratch. And we were able to do that quite a bit. And therefore, we've got a very, very good engine that's just underneath all this. So we like to talk about this on living the life of someone earning less than $2 a day. Um, I don't think I need to really go into an explanation of that, but uh, it's not very easy. And um, so you kind of put yourself in the right frame of mind where we're really trying to help people at that end of the spectrum just frankly join a system. And, and not get ripped off because if they get ripped off, if they fall to create a fraud, it could be their life savings, their decade savings, their, you know, it's, it's horrible. It's a horrible situation. So what is a digital public good? Um, it's something that we, uh, we believe is the key to achieving financial inclusion. So there's lots of different fragment systems out there. Those are things we've been working on for quite a while, 2007. 
Um, we eventually got to connected systems or how do we do interoperability between systems in uh, 2018. Um, but now we're starting to move beyond just the idea of, um, of a payment system being a digital public good or something that provides something that lends itself towards um, some sort of a payment. We're also seeing that we're, we're we, you know, stopping fraud, um, stops expenditure, um, re, you know, pulls that out of the system, and therefore, in turn, um, uh, you, you have a lower cost or lower barrier to get in. So public good may actually be a lot broader. And, and yes, obviously, public good can be any public good. But when we're talking about here, we're talking about financial inclusive type goods. And the fraud stuff can be a little bit different to, uh, to follow. So Mojo Loop, like I mentioned, it transforms real-time payments, um, lower cop cost of capital up front, lower maintenance cost um, because the effort is shared across many organizations, no vendor lock-in, uh, lower cost to acquire uh, with additional functionality and things like that. So these are the same principles with that we are following with the open source software. Lower cost of capital up front, lower maintenance costs, et cetera, et cetera. So it's the exact same thing. It's just that we're focusing on the fraud side of things. Now. Uh, the Mojaloop community itself has grown to uh, about uh, 1,200 participants, six continents, 47 countries. So we're hoping that uh, we'll, we'll ride on their coattails a little bit and think that we'll have the benefit of being able to do that. But we are not restricted to be working with them at all. In fact, we don't want to be seen like that. We don't want to be seen as a Mojaloop project, which we are not. We are a completely independent project. Um, we're going to take it more of our wings uh, this year. Uh, basically, we got the MVP got done this year. Uh, we're going to create a center of excellence surrounding this, and we're going to start defining it more in this year. So what is um, what is fraud risk management system? What's a system for doing this in, in, in general? Um, you know, going back to the beginning of Mojo, like I said, it was always envisioned there would be some sort of anti-fraud. Uh, the first thing that was commissioned was something that lovingly became to be called the thieves guide, <laughs> which basically meant if you did all the instructions in the exact opposite, you would probably be, probably be a pretty good thief. Um, so that was commissioned to explore all the fraud patterns, the anti-fraud pro uh, programs for mobile money and things like that. But its focus was really only on mobile money and only on certain types of things. Uh, but it was a very good starting point and a very good guide. We still use the book regularly. Um, next, a group that was originally run by Deloitte uh, did studies on fraud typologies that affected central switches. Now keep in mind that Mojo Loop is designed to be a centralized switch or a switch that runs at the government level. Um, however, I've been proving in my company that we can do it, use it for a lot more things. We're doing it with Pan-African banks and a variety of others and getting some, some good benefit out of that. Um, so this was originally started by Deloitte and some of us started helping to expand on those typologies. And then eventually it, it became a full-fledged project about 18, 19 months ago. So why do we start now? Um, I, I love this phrase. Um, it's from Jurgen Stock, who's the Interpol Secretary General. Uh, with more than 4.5 billion people online, more than half of humanity is at risk of falling victim to cybercrime at any time, requiring a unified and strong response. Uh, that's why we're doing this now, and that's why we're speeding things up, and that's why we're hopefully building a very good engine that other people can utilize and can leverage and can um, jointly work with us on. So it was codenamed Actio. Um, we gave that, that, that name, Latin for action, um, but it's really not going to be the name. We haven't decided that. There'll be a whole focus session and, and an organization that will deal with that process as far as the legality of it. Um, but for right now, we still call it Actio. Um, that will not be the name at some point in time. So uh, it's a newly developed open source transactional monitoring system. And the key is fraud risk management system. I was talking about that just a minute ago. And now I'm talking about a transactional monitoring system. All right. So a transactional monitoring system is part of an overall risk mitigation program or, or, or system. Um, we're, we're calling it the, the whole system that we're trying to do a fraud risk management system, but this is specifically talking to transactional monitoring and what we can do with it. So the, the goal behind here is to reduce fraud, money laundering, the financing of terrorism and the greater financial ecosystem uh, to reduce the cost of fighting all those issues because there's an awful lot of expense that goes into that. Um, provide systems for those organizations that it could not otherwise afford it. 
um, ideal, I'm, I'm on the African continent and I deal on a, feels like a daily basis with people that um, only are taking their fraud efforts or their anti-fraud efforts to a certain level simply because they, they just don't have the budget. So it's a choice, operate or not operate. So they have to make that hard decision of, yes, we'd love to crank up what we can do. We'd love to do that at a higher level. We just can't. So hopefully these types of programs will give those legs uh, back to them and they'll be able to, to, do, to take some action and do some things. Um, we'll be uh, increasing financial inclusion by uh, reducing the pass-through costs of customers due to fraud and fraud mitigation. So there is an enormous amount of cost that gets passed through in the fraud programs. There's always going to be loss. We can't get rid of loss. Um, what we can do is reduce it to an acceptable level. So you've got to pass through the cost of the loss. You've got to pass through the cost of the system. You've got to pass through the cost of all the people running them and everything else. And it, it gets really expensive. And then depending on what country you're in or what jurisdiction you're in, um, depending on if they determine if it's fraud or not, uh, that fraud may be passed on and, and the organization itself may be forced to eat that cost. Um, in which case it goes back into the system as more cost. So there's an awful lot of stuff that goes along with this. Uh, so, so who's this for? It's for financial service providers, obviously system integrators. So people that want to build services around this, it's for regulators. Um, so a regulator in a small country like say Malawi could put a product like this on a list that could be available to a small insurance company or a small FinTech that says, hey, I want to be running um, something for my anti-fraud program, but I just can't afford it. I don't know where to go. Hey, check out this. There's a lower cost barrier entry to entry in doing this. Um, let's start here. So that's how the regulators could be involved. But on the ISB side, one of the things that I'm excited about is the way that we designed this engine is so that it can be plugged into different points and it can be extended at different points. So right now we're focused mainly on payments, but we take out what's called the PPA, the payment adapter at the front end or, or what, what reads the actions or the activities, replace that with something for insurance, and now we've got an insurance system. Right now we're not a lot, we're, we're, we don't do a lot with machine learning, um, mainly because the regulators are unsure about it. Um, it's a black box kind of a solution. Uh, you, yes, you can see what you put into it to run, but you don't necessarily know how it made the decision. So what we've allowed is a path um, in here so that you could run machine machine learning and then back that up with, with an algorithmic type approach or things like that. So, so an ISV could get really creative with it, this because of the fact that it's an engine. So what if you wanted to make something that was focused on the, the fraud around um, uh, identity, identity theft or identity fraud, you know, synthetic identities. And, and part of that process was figuring out you know, all, all these things were, were coming up, people were coming from IP addresses in the wrong locations and things like that. And that is, that's something that we normally try to, um, to, to pull into the picture, right? But if, if, if you have an engine that is reading directly from the cyber tools, the cyber tool kit, and combining that with the fraud tool kit, you're going to have something very powerful. So I do think there's a lot of, a lot of room to innovate um, and get creative here. So, you know, what are we trying to do in general? Uh, we're trying to save the money with open source software. We, we want to tune this um, and calibrate it so it's just to your needs, just what you need, just what you need to solve that situation so that you don't, you know, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on a system that you're going to only use 20% of. Um, so basically implement exactly what you need. Again, low cost to acquire, low cost to implement, low cost to rent. That's we all know the mantra here and, and what we're trying to do as far as the so software. So what is this? Um, well, first off, let's talk about the fact that we went with a, a, a model called semi-attached. Part of that Deloitte research was on researching models for operation. And again, this was focused primarily on, um, on uh, centralized switches. So what we wound up choosing was, um, because it was more ubiquitous, it worked for more in more situations for more people, is a semi-attached model. And that is where there's a centralized financial prime risk, every, all the payments are going through a hub, but all the digital financial service providers or DFSPs are running a piece of the action on their own because frankly, they're always responsible for uh, whether they're putting good or bad transactions on into the system. 
Um, so this is called the semi-attached model as the model that we follow at the moment. The portions in green are the portions that were built out for uh, the MVP. One thing I'd like to point out is this is kind of a part of a, a three-legged stool. So you've got your KYC screening and your due diligence that goes up front. We leverage that data heavily. You've got your nightly screening, changes that happen overnight. Uh, we leverage that as well. We are the transaction monitor. So we're, we're um, the payment transaction. We're the transaction to change a value within a system. It's a right uh, for somebody to access something, a uh, password, things like that. We're, we're that behind the scenes that's, that's crawling through the logs and saying that user shouldn't have done this on behalf of that other uh, customer, for example. So this information could come from, from all over the place. Uh, but the bottom line is, is what you've got, you've got customers, these institutions, the individuals, the financial service providers that are servicing them, you've got them, and then you've got a switching hub. That switching hub in this model is really meant as a central hub or a central environment, but it could be any type of switch. It could be uh, EFTs, ACH, et cetera. Um, and in that monitoring, then we've got basically the monitoring API service that monitors what's going on, data preparation. The data preparation is huge in that the data preparation, it's, it's all about the data and, and being able to make a good decision. Uh, data preparation is everything from uh, cast or, um, forecast polls forward, um, pre-aggregates, just, just a lot of different things. Um, then there's the actual transaction evaluation, and then it spits out basically for the transaction and for the topology. So you could have multiple topologies that fire per transaction or one or none. And then it sends that information to a JSON file, which is packaged up so that all the information can go into a case management system of each way. So that could be an open source product, could be whatever you want. Um, could, could be Salesforce for that matter. At that point, then you would go into analytics investigation mode um, and you're working back and forth with the regulators. So that's kind of how it fits into the, the whole system. <clears throat> so let's talk through this scenario. We've got a typology breakdown. A typology is just that. It's just a, an, an ordered structure of how uh, certain things work together. Um, so we've got a Damu uh, doing electronic funds transfer on mobile money, going through the payment switch. We've got Bingwa doing an EFT through the bank. We've got uh, Cheji doing a cash deposit uh, through a money remitter. And it's all going into that central hub. All right. The transaction amounts are very similar for each transaction and they're all cashing out to two different people. So um, it, you can see that within an organization and put together that picture and that becomes um, a scam. So this is a typology 28. It's an overall generalized uh, scam typology, false promotions, fishing, social engineering, things like that. Um, but when you have a switch involved, you can actually see what's going on more because you've got multiple banks or mul multiple financial um, institutions uh, sending the information upstream. So you can see, you know, the, they are getting to, you know, lots of payments for these two people, but they're coming from these three people at these bank, this bank and these three people at the other bank. So that is, that's a huge thing. Uh, it's not done a lot, a lot of, you know, switches are opaque as far as information. That's something that we're trying to change. So to continue on with the, you know, what is a false promotion, phishing, social engineering, let's do the rules breakdown. So the, 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 there's all the information about the debtor. Did the debtor make a very large payment? Did the debtor make a larger payment than usual? Is the debtor in a vulnerable age category? So someone over say 65 or something like that. Did the debtor's account activity increase compared to their history? Is this the first time the debtor is paying this particular creditor, this particular person? Did the debtor pay the same creditor more than once? So we're looking for repetition or, or, or volumes there. Um, so this goes to the, tr the transaction monitor, everything goes through there, the topology is evaluated. On the creditor side, we're looking at things. Did the creditor receive a large number of similar transaction amounts? Does the creditor receive payments from a large number of different debtors? Was the creditor's account dormant for an extended period of time? In other words, did it go dormant and just came up live just for this one situation? Do amounts flowing into the creditor's account appear artificially random? All right, something that's called Benford's Law. 
Uh, does the creditor's outgoing transaction amounts match the sum of incoming amounts? Did the creditor's account activity increase compared to their history, et cetera, et cetera? I'm not going to waste a lot more time with that. But that's basically a typology that is made of these individual rules. So all these individual rules may be used by one or more typologies. And in fact, that's exactly what we've got here. So one of the things that we were able to do is we created a concept that we call the network map. And, and it takes a look at the type of transaction and it says, for example, if this is not a Forex transaction, it's never going to run a Forex typology. So why run anything for a Forex typology? All right. So some simple things, uh, you know, ruling th different things out. But then it also takes a look and it says, all these right here require this particular rule. This is Benver's law. Do amounts flowing into the creditor's account appear artificially random? All right. So basically what that means is that map will tell us that for that particular transaction, we need to run that rule once and only once. And then that will benefit all these different other typologies. And that's some, one of the many, many ways we get additional tuning and we get additional performance out of the system. Okay, so let's move on to typology modeling. Uh, there is a lot that goes into this. We're not sure how to share this information yet. Um, and needless to say, if we make it too public, the bad guys have, have to get a hold of it. Bad guys are probably going to get a hold of it anyway. Uh, so there's lots of um, conflicting uh, opinions on how to deal with this. But for the most part, we'll, we'll probably, it'll be a select group that has to pass some, some sort of background check to get access to the typologies. There will be a group that continues um, you know, working on typologies and updating them, understanding how to use them. And then normally when you, you're putting something like this in place, you would hire someone like, like a Deloitte, for example. Um, and they would go and they say, hey, you have this type of data, therefore you can determine these type of things in these amount of time frames, and then we'd apply the typologies to it and all, and all the different rules and stuff like that. But there's a lot of uh, information uh, that goes into these different typologies. So what is the process flow? This is where things get interesting. So I mentioned that PPA adapter. Um, basically, we receive um, you know, from the client platform transaction message. In this case, all this is, is centered around ISO 222. Uh, this could be any type of format, any type of message uh, that, that's irrelevant. So it all kicks off with this uh, PPA adapter that what monitoring the system. Um, there's the APIs that are for the transaction monitoring system that understand what's going on and route the messages for data preparation and things like that. There's the whole data prep layer that has to go on. Data prep is continuously going on. We have a series of um, things that do um, a data governance, um, uh, and then as well as tracking all the journey and all the manipulation, all the adjustments to the data, and you know, where the source of data is and things like that. Um, we have the CRISP layer, which is basically figures out what's the channel route right? A channel is another concept that's used for tuning. We have this concept called multiple channels. If you have real-time rules, for example, that have to run very fast, normally people would think of credit card rules. Um, we would run those in a separate chain. So part of that um, transaction analysis would be, do I need a real-time check? Do I need a real-time addiction? Yes, I do. It's only three, these three rules. These three rules will run in that channel. And then later on, after that channel has been processed, the other rules will catch up and things along those lines. Uh, we have all the individual rules. Uh, they're all, again, um, working off of an ISO 222 uh, compliant uh, model. Um, we then uh, have the aggregator for the transaction and uh, the channel aggregator that goes on. So um, basically, we evaluated the topology level. Did the topology have enough stuff to fire? Um, what if we ran five typologies for a, a given circumstance, but none of the five hit their limit, but two of them when combined did actually hit their limit. So we're evaluating for things like that. And then we're evaluating at the channel level as well. And then we're doing, we're, uh, again, we're aggregating at the, at the actual transaction level. So did anything fire for the transaction? And then at that point, we, we export, we basically create a series of files that are used for two things. Although we say CMS, the reality is it's if you have a system where we have to send an alert someplace else, and then the CMS system that would work most ways we see stuff is with CMS 
which will then fire off the alerts and stuff like that and start the investigation process. Um, all of this basically means that once we get to the channel processor router setup, there's an awful lot of things going in flight and we've got the ability to auto scale, scale up and uh, scale down um, to, uh, to manage all these different things. So, um, and the, the topology life cycle is, is interesting. Basically, you need to develop the individual rules. You need to sit back and compose the individual topology. Um, so one in those rules, um, you know, go together and how do they go together to make up that typology and deploy the typology. Then you have to calibrate the typology. So we mentioned age earlier, age is an early one for a determination of both age of account, um, a scenario like that, if an account has not been, been dormant for 90 days and suddenly it's activated, you maybe you should take a look at that. Um, or if a certain type of a scam, something that fits a scam portfolio is suddenly working for someone that's like say over the age of 65 or 70. But that would need to be calibrated for your particular environment. You could have a, a younger set of users, you could have an older set of users, um, all those calibrations need to occur, and that's part of this entire process. So the first is we, we, we build and define the rule, then we compose those into typologies, we deploy those typologies, and then, <coughs> excuse me, for the given circumstance, for, um, for a user, we would calibrate that for their environment and for their needs. And in this case, uh, typology 28, which is, we, we abbreviated and call it SCAMS, um, has all those rules, rule 3, 8, 10, 11, 16, 18, and so on. Um, and then everything after the at simple is the version low. Okay. Uh, from a data model standpoint, we have a robust data model. We um, take advantage of a multimodal database. So we do have a graph database and we have a document database uh, in the system. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. Um, nevertheless, it all works well together, and we use NiFi as far as feeding the system and um, getting things into and out of the system, um, doing manipulations on, on the system, things like that. Excuse me. And I'll just move on with those items. Some of the stuff that you're probably more interested in talking about is these. What is the actual architecture? Um, Again, our remit, and I think I missed that slide here somewhere, but there was supposed to be a remit as far as what it is that we were doing. And what I mean by that is, is we had a target of being able to process 3,000 transactions a second. And we had a, a target of being able to process a single individual typology within 35 seconds. So if there needed to be a real-time stoppage of something, uh, in the case of a real-time interdiction, that could be done within 35 seconds. Now, what we've done with all this is at the beginning of the project, we actually timed everything out and, and proved um, that we could meet, make those speeds. In fact, we, we tripled the speeds. Um, then once we could prove them, we went into how do we create a simple, uh, a simple solution that solves a not very simple uh, problem and can be managed pretty well. Um, so basically from there, we, we, we adjusted the parts, the pieces and parts as far as what we were using. Um, you know, Ambassador, for example, is our API gateway where we sit with inside uh, services mesh, there's Linkerd, so all the security folds up. The Actio individual services that create those channels that run as those individual tunable channels uh, run in OpenFast, which also scales up and scales down. Um, Ashy Vault, Ashy Corp for the Vault, Key Cloak, et cetera. Uh, we do use caching. We use Redis caching and RangoDB for the persistent data store. Uh, the Elk stack, as far as the APM, the dashboards, and the reports, we do have complete telemetry on this entire solution. Um, as I mentioned, NiFi is, is in use for, uh, we use it both for the pseudo anonymization in the layer because we're, we're trying to take that risk out of things. Uh, we're doing it for the entity resolution and a lot of the data transformation, the persistence, the whole model, how it runs through the entire system. And then <coughs> the whole thing runs in a Kubernetes stack. Um, and we uh, the CICD is basically run by Jenkins, uh, testing and Postman, and there's another testing uh, objects that are, uh, that are, are Newman only. Um, that is about what I've got for you. Um, 
what I am going to go into is 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 kind of the end of the presentation. Um, this was kind of interesting because we weren't trying to give you a lot of tech, and we weren't trying to you know show you enough tech. Um, we were trying to show you the problem we were solving. So this is the actual slide, one of the um, the early slides that went with Mojo, which said you know building an ecosystem that benefits everybody. Um, I've taken that and I've added an anti-fraud ecosystem that benefits everybody, still benefits fintech, central banks, governments, merchants, users. Um, we're in the process of building over the course of the next year the open source fraud risk management system center of excellence. Um, I have no idea what that's going to be called yet. It's going to be an interesting journey as we go through the year um, and we'll see. So thank you very much. Um, join us. There's plenty of room to engage. You, uh, we're looking for adopters. We're looking for people um, that, uh, that that, that want to be early in, that maybe, maybe have a, a customized need even. We're looking for that. We're looking for people that would contribute, and we're looking for people that have joined uh, the foundation. Or excuse me, it won't be a foundation. It'll be a center of excellence. So thank you very much. Again, my name is Greg McCormick. I'm the Mojo Loop Foundation Technical. I'm on the governing board uh, for the technical board. And um, at Cyber Systems, I'm the Chief Strategic Business Development Officer. Um, those are my uh, my emails. Um, when it comes to this in particular, if you're trying to reach out to me, I would use my personal email first. Um, we're trying to run this stuff kind of independently. Uh, but Cyber is a major part of, of the organization. It's a very proud uh, supporting sponsor. It's, uh, basically, they ran this project for the past 18 months. So thank you very much.